and then Department of Transportation that we cite. If the court so you wants reject to look, the distinction that the, that the SG pointed to with respect to what those cases were about. Those were not standing cases. We have different doctrines that apply when we're looking at different issues, and the issue of whether or not you are injured by uh, you know an injury to another entity, an independent corporation, seems to me to be a separate thing. So, do you have a case that would help us to understand whether? Uh, an entity like Mohila that has totally been isolated through state law from liability, that can sue for itself, et cetera. Do you have a case where we've said that same kind of entity uh, you can sue as a state in, because you're injured for standing purposes? Your Honor, I think the closest cases we have are the ones I referenced before, Cherry Cotton Mills and uh, Erickson. But I will say that part of the inquiry has to look to state law to see if Missouri is charged with speaking, has the ability to speak on behalf of Mohila. And on that front, I would point the court to two things. One is Missouri Statute 27.06.060, which gives the Attorney General the right to determine whether to litigate um, in the name of the state to protect any interest of the state. And because Mohila well, of course that's is the question an, here, right? But because Mohila yeah. is a part of the state, I see. and the second point that I would direct the court to is the casualty reciprocal exchange case. That's the case that specifically identified what it means to be a public corporation under Missouri state law, and it identifies the same factors that LeBron looked to. It's whether it was created by the government, controlled by the government, and whether it's performing essential public purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. (coughs) Rebuttal, general. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I'll pick up with standing and focus on the Mohila-related arguments. Justice Barrett, you asked about a provision of state law 173.420. This is a provision that refers generally to Missouri reserving rights over the assets of Mohila. I think if you look at that in context, it clearly functions as a savings clause. It's making clear that notwithstanding all of the other provisions we've pointed to, like 173.425, 0.42. 410, these are the provisions that create the strict financial separation, that Missouri is reserving its rights under other sources of law, like eminent domain or search and seizure, and it's not actually limiting its ability to obtain assets in that way. I understand my friend to have conceded that actually Missouri would have to change its law and change the structure of Mohila if it wanted to have any direct access to Mohila's assets, and that makes sense because these other provisions that I just pointed you to are very clear that there is absolute financial separation between the state and Mohila. Uh, You asked as well about control over Mohila, which my friends have emphasized several times. That's actually one of the relevant questions under the arm of the state doctrine, whether you could direct the authority in any way. I'd point to Justice Kavanaugh's decision in the D.C. Circuit in the Puerto Rico Ports Authority case. There it was significant that you could direct the, the authority to sue, and here that's obviously lacking, and the state hasn't attempted to do that. My friend uh, several times brought up the Cherry Cotton Mill and Erickson cases. In Cherry Cotton Mill, there was an express statutory right of the United States to tax offsets, and the court was interpreting that statutory language and determined that the United States had its own interest in the statutory right and further emphasized that with respect to that particular public corporation, and I'm reading from the language of the court's opinion, that for the public corporation, its profits, if any, go to the government, its losses the government must bear. There wasn't the financial separation in that case that exists here, and there was a distinct statutory right on behalf of the United States. Erickson is even further afield. It wasn't a case about standing at all, and there the United States had a contract right that the instrumentality had entered into as an agent of the federal government. The instrumentality was itself a plaintiff in that case, and there was no Article Three issue in the case. Finally, I'll focus on the contributions to the Lewis and Clark Discovery Fund. This is the secondary argument as it relates to Mohila. There are huge factual deficiencies in trying to premise standing on that basis. As we've explained, they haven't been able to bring forward allegations that would substantiate the asserted financial impacts on Mohila and certainly haven't established that that will be the likely cause of any default to a fund that hasn't been paid for the last 15 years. But there's also a more fundamental legal problem with their theory. It has no logical stopping point. There's nothing, for example, that would prevent anyone who's owed a debt to say that suddenly they can have standing to challenge a regulation that doesn't affect them in any way because it might affect the debtor who then will be unable to make good on that 
on that liability. And there is no precedent in this court's Article III doctrine to support that kind of broad expansion of Article III standing here. Turning to the merits, I want to pick up on the colloquies that my friend was having about the meaning of the term waiver modify. And if I understand the gloss that he's putting on that language, I don't think that there would be any room to grant any kind of HEROES Act relief whatsoever. He says that there was no waiver or modification here, but there was. The Secretary took the provisions that deal with discharge and cancellation, and he waived the existing eligibility requirements and modified those provisions to add an additional basis for relief. This is how secretaries across administrations have implemented the HEROES Act. For example, with deferment, the Secretary, in prior uses of the HEROES Act, took the provisions that exist for deferment and waived the existing eligibility requirements and then granted additional deferment in line with the national emergency. That fits with the plain language of the statute, and to suggest that that automatically creates a brand new program would leave very little room for the HEROES Act to operate at all. My friend is getting it exactly backwards. The fact that there are already statutory provisions for things like deferment and forbearance and discharge demonstrates that Congress could foresee that all of those are ways that you grant financial relief to student loan borrowers. And in the context of a statute like this one that is centrally focused on ensuring that the Secretary can act in unforeseen circumstances outside the existing scope of those provisions, Congress directed that the Secretary has the authority to waive or modify in order to expand eligibility for those forms of relief. So we'd ask the Court to reject the State's arguments here. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted.